Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Oh, hallelujah. Good morning, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of His Word? Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? Can we give a shout out to Ryan Edgar for being home this morning? We love this brother. You know, I pick on him calling him the grandfather of Wogan worship because it was about 12 years ago that he first established our live worship ministry here. My wife just said, between the two services just now, she said, you know how you always call him the grandfather of our worship? Maybe he's the godfather. <laughs> Amen. So Ryan, we love you. Welcome home this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis. Want to go to the 11th chapter. If you're taking notes, today is part 27 of the Genesis prophecies. I told you from the start, I wanted to break down and study the first 12 chapters of the Bible. So we'll get to chapter 12, Lord willing, and that's where we'll close. And we're only one chapter away, which means we should finish in about 12 weeks. So we'll see what happens, all right? Genesis chapter number 11, if you're there, just say amen. amen. We'll look at it in uh, the first six or seven verses, and then I'll pray, and you can be seated. You know, uh, as I minister this word, we've got a congregation over at our Bozier campus that are assembled there. Can we give them a shout out this morning? Good morning, Bozier. We love you guys. And also, this morning, we have people watching from all over. I thought I would just highlight the places that people are watching us this morning on YouTube. All over Texas, Longview, Dallas, uh, let's see here, Houston, San Antonio, Gladewater. Uh, so those of you in, in, in Texas, good morning to you. Fresno, uh, Texas. Camp Fuller in Columbia, Mississippi, Franklinton, Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, Winter Garden, Florida, Port Bryan, Illinois, Waldo, Arkansas, Cleveland, Ohio, Virginia, Columbus, Ohio, South Bend, Indiana. I left out Deberry, but y'all right down the road, you could have been here. <laughs> Texarkana, you, you can make the drive, come on down. Bell Chase, Louisiana, Matarey, Louisiana, Lacoma, North Carolina, Los Angeles, California, Flint, Michigan, Graham, Washington, Tuscan, Arizona, and Billings, Montana. I've actually been there. That's, there's no Walmart there. That's a cool place. And uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Let's give all those places a shout out that are watching us on YouTube this morning. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit that subscribe button, all right? Genesis chapter number 11, we'll begin in verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Let us make us a name, pride, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth, which is what God had intended. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, the people is one. They have one language. They're in agreement. And this they began to do. They hadn't finished it yet. This they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do, which shows us the power of the imagination. So God said, go to let us, because he's a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So everybody that spoke, they all went that way. Everybody said, they all went that way. 
<laughs> Hope I didn't offend anybody with my messed up rendition there. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, which just means confusion, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So nations were established based on languages. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry gift of your Holy Spirit. And I pray for all who would be under the sound of my voice at this very moment, for those here in our Shreveport and Bossier campuses and those as far as Billings, Montana. We ask, Father, that you would bless our hearing and that by your Holy Spirit we would receive revelation knowledge. We ask you for wisdom. We ask you for spiritual understanding and a conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. I ask now, Father, that you would speak through me the words that you would have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, and that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that I would write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Greet your neighbors, Shreveport Bossier, and then take your seats. Now, I said that Billings, Montana didn't have a Walmart. I, don't, I, I just remember the first time I ever entered Montana, we crossed the state line, stopped at this convenience store, and my wife said, by the way, ask them where Walmart is. And I asked the guy behind the counter in Montana where a Walmart was, and it, I might as well have offended him. He looked me straight in the face, we don't have no Walmart here. I said, I like this place. No offense, Walmart. So I'm not sure about Billings, but I do remember having been there, all right? So listen, let me say this real quick before we get back to Genesis 11. We have some push cards out in the foyer, Shreveport and Bossier. Make sure you get a handful and invite all you can out to the Olive Bait Conference. Did Olive Tov bless you? And has Olive Tov blessed you? Somebody asked me the other day, said, wait a minute now, are we replacing Olive Tov with Olive Bait? Oh, no, 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 we're adding the Olive Tov, Olive Bait. There's still an Olive Tov conference coming up. We're going to take it back to the arena. More information about that real soon. But don't miss the Olive Bait conference. I remember... Some months ago, where well, the Lord just started opening to me this revelation of Olive Bait, I literally asked God, I was like, why haven't I seen this before? And the Holy Spirit just gently reminded me that he hides things for us, not from us, like I do my wife's chocolate. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. And God knows exactly when to reveal it. And I believe that the Olive Bay Conference is for such a time as this. It'll be a blessing. So make sure and invite somebody, all right? So let's turn our attention. Genesis chapter 11. We're in part 27, if you're taking notes, part 27 of the Genesis prophecies. A subtitle for today would be the Tower of Babel. So we look in Genesis 11. We'll read this again because we're going to break down these first uh, six verses. So verse 1 says, The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is Babylon. This is modern-day Iraq, about 50 miles south of Baghdad. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now, mind you that these are still the days of Noah. Noah was still alive in the earth at the building of the Tower of Babel. This is about 300 plus years after the flood. And some have said that's why they wanted to build this tower, was so that they'd be prepared for any future flood that God might send upon the earth. And notice they said, let us make us a name. There's pride and arrogance in play lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, that is direct opposition against what God's plan for man was since the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, the Bible says that when God made male and female in his own image, 
His word for man, male and female, was to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth, to populate the earth. And after the flood, when God spoke to Noah in chapter 9, the Bible says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So God's plan for man had not changed. Be fruitful, male and female, have children, and, 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 and multiply throughout the earth. Well, when you get to the 10th chapter, which we didn't really read, you find this man by the name of Nimrod. He is the first king mentioned in Scripture. The Bible says in verses 9 and 10 that this Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so that's who we're reading of here in Genesis 11. This is under the leadership of a man by the name of Nimrod, who in my opinion is a type of antichrist, who was in rebellion against God. And so his objective is, as well, since God wants us to scatter upon the, upon the face of the whole earth, we'll just build a city and a tower right here. We'll make our own name, and we won't be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. But when God got through doing what only God can do, they scattered upon the face of the earth. God will always have what he says, no matter what man does with the word of God. And we see the enemy's objective from the very beginning that no matter what God says, the enemy loves to come in and contradict what God says. God gives man a commandment that he alone as God reserves the right to define what is good and evil so man is not to touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does Satan say to Eve? Oh, you shall be as gods. You will know good and evil and you won't die if you eat of this tree. Jesus said in John 8, that Satan is the father of lies. And the lie that was sold on these people in Genesis chapter 11 through this wicked king by the name of Nimrod was nothing more than the enemy doing what he does. But I want to focus in on something that could be easily overlooked that I think we can glean from. And that is, is the power of the imagination and the power of confession. Notice that they had imagined to do something. The Lord came down to see what they had imagined to do. We read it in verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have one language, and this they begin to do. See, it hadn't been done yet. They had begun to do it. It had only gotten started. And the Bible says God came down to see what they had begun to do. And he says in verse 6, Now nothing, nothing, will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. God said they have developed this image, this vision of this city and this tower. They are all in agreement. They're all speaking the same thing. They're, they are unified in this assignment. This is not my will. They are after their own agenda, building their own city after their own name, contradicting my word. And the Lord came down and confused their languages so that they would break off and divide. And notice that the way God was to stop an image from becoming reality was he confused language. Why? Because there is a connection between what is in our mind and what comes out of our mouth. And I want to talk about that today. So if you would, put a bookmark here in Genesis 11 and come with me to 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter. Not Corinthians, stay in the Old Testament and come with me to 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter. If you can get to Samuel, keep turning. First and Second Kings, keep turning. 1 Chronicles, chapter number 28. And when you get over there, just say amen. 1 Chronicles, chapter number 28. And watch this down in verse number 9. We want to talk about imagination and confession. Now, I know these are unbelievers in rebellion against God. But notice the power that they had harnessed that arrested the attention of God and that they understood the capacity to, to dream, to envision, and to develop an image and to speak and act in line with that vision. That is a plan that God has had for man all along 
And unfortunately, many born-again believers don't know the power of imagination, don't know the power of what I put in my mind, what I meditate on, and what I confess is a power that God has put within man, that God himself builds based on image. When God made man, he made him, Genesis 126 says, in his own image, which means God uses imagery to build. And being that God made man in his own image and God used his image to build, then man himself has the capacity to image and then build. You don't have to be born again to see the doghouse in your mind's eye to go down to the Home Depot and buy the, the right materials to build the doghouse or the flower bed or whatever else you have imagined to do. Everybody has the ability to imagine a thing and then to act based on that imagination. So with that being said, watch what is spoken in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and we'll look at it down in verse number 9. God uses imagery to build. When he told Moses to build the tabernacle in the earth, what did he do? He showed him the one in heaven, and he said, what you have seen in heaven, now build that in the earth. God uses imagery to build. That is the power of hope. That is the power of vision. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit, that our young men would see visions, that our old men would dream dreams. God wants you to vision your life and your future. Just because wicked men tapped a power in Genesis chapter 11 doesn't mean born-again believers shouldn't tap that power for good. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to show you this is not some new age or old age stuff. This is biblical. Watch this in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. When you get there, say amen. Amen. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. I just report, Bozier, read the latter part of this with me out loud. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. So what is the word of David to his son Solomon? Serve God with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For God our Father searches our hearts and understands our imaginations. And that's what we're seeing in Genesis chapter 11. The Lord came down to see what they hadn't even built yet. But where was it built? It was built in their imagination. They had imagined to do it. Come with me, if you would, to the New Testament, the book of James, and I want to go to the third chapter. What they were building was outside the will and word of God. And we're living in a society today where individuals are building off of an image or a vision that is outside the will and word of God. You and I as believers have got to get back to his word and allow his word to become the source of our hope and the source of our vision and the source of our imaginations so that our thoughts and the, and the thoughts of our heart and the imaginations of our mind are based on the written word of God so that as I hear God's word, I meditate on God's word. And as I meditate on God's word, I confess God's word. And as I hear, meditate, and confess, I act on God's word. That's how we live by faith. I'm reminded of what God told Habakkuk in chapter number two when Habakkuk in verse number one set himself to seek the Lord. Habakkuk said this of himself. He said, I will stand upon my watch and will wait to see what he will say to me. Habakkuk got before God and wanted his will and wanted his word. And what did God do? He responded to Habakkuk's expectation and he gave him a word. And here's what he tells him in Habakkuk 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, Habakkuk, I'm going to give you a vision and I want you to write it. I want you to write this vision to every person of the sound of my voice, old and young. Get a vision for your life. Write that vision down. That's the will of God. He says, Habakkuk, write this vision. And that vision that Habakkuk was to write was not just for himself, not just so he could be accountable to 
the vision and hope that God had given him because the Lord tells Habakkuk, write this vision in such a way that whoever else reads it can run with it too, which means the vision that God gave Habakkuk was to be communicated, to be shared, and as God would give him vision and he would share that vision, the Lord through him sharing that vision could bring about provision and bring people unified with Habakkuk to bring that vision to pass. And he would give Habakkuk in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, three action words to that vision. He was to write it, he was to run with it, and he was to wait on it. Glory to God. And when God gives you vision in your life, write it. That's for you. Write it. That's for others. Communicate. Because God will use that vision to cause the right people to run with you in life. And those, those relationships that God wants to bring into our life should be based on the common unity, the community of what we've said the vision is. In Genesis chapter 11, the vision was all wrong. The leadership under Nimrod was based on one of rebellion and opposition to God. But we can learn of how much more power could somebody unified in the name of Jesus and unified under the, the authority of God's word, how much more could we achieve if we got before God and received his word and meditated on his word and confessed his word and acted on his word and then every believer began to unify under that shared vision? How much more could we accomplish for the kingdom of God if we would learn from this powerful principle? Can you say Amen. So, so watch this in James chapter number four. I may have said chapter three, but watch this in chapter four where God says this in verse 13. When I read of what they were doing at Babel, this is a verse I was reminded of because they were after their own glory. They had their own agenda. They were doing their own thing in rebellion against God. But watch what the word of God tells us in, in relationship to our vision and to our future for our life. Verse 13, James 4. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then it vanishes away. For that you ought to say, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, come on somebody, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings and all such rejoicing is evil. So what God is saying is, is we don't have the authority to say what we're going to do on tomorrow or what we're going to do next year. And so the arrogance of Nimrod in his kingdom to think that they could oppose the will and word of God and have what they said, God always has the last word. Yeah. Amen. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that built it. What Nimrod and his followers were doing was in vain because it wasn't in line with the will and the word of God. And how many of us have set out to do a thing out of our own mind? for our own name and for our own glory and weeks pass and months pass and years pass and we look back and what we set out to do has never been achieved. Why? Because we didn't get before God like Habakkuk did in chapter 2 verse 1 and find God's will and God's vision and God's plan for our life and say, Lord, I want your will. I want your word. I want your purpose in my life. That way my thoughts are in line with your will and my words are in line with your will and and my actions are in line with your will. If this is making sense to you, just say amen. amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whatever we do, whether we eat or whether we drink, we should do all for the glory of God. I'm living for a glory greater than my own. I'm, li I'm living for a purpose that's greater than my own. Oh, hallelujah. So notice here, and if you would turn over with me to Ephesians, that there is a relationship between your mind and your mouth. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 12, 35 when he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's this marriage between mind and mouth and they are powerful. 
Romans 10, 10 says, for with the heart, we believe unto righteousness, but it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. There's this relationship between what I think and what I say that's been ordained by God. We see how powerful it is with the children of, uh, 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 of, 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 of the earth in Genesis 11 under Nimrod in that they had imagined something. They were all communicating it in agreement. And God said, the way I stop this image from becoming a manifested thing in the earth is all I got to do is interrupt their language. And once I interrupt their language, then I can stop this vision from coming to pass. Because what they were building was not in line with the will of God. Watch this in Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll look at it in verse number 20. Ephesians 3, 20, if you're there, say amen. amen. Now, I want you to pull out two words in this verse. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask, underline, circle that, all that we ask or think, underline, circle those two words, ask and think according to the power that worketh in us. What did God just say right here? He said, I will do exceeding. I will do exceeding. I will do abundantly above all that you could ask. That's your mouth. Or think that's your mind. What's God saying? If you get your thinking right and you get your speaking right, I can do exceeding abundantly above what you think or what you ask. He's dealing with my mind. He's dealing with my mouth. And they do matter. Too many of us think one thing, but then say another and act like it doesn't matter by saying things like, well, I know that's what I said, but God knows what's in my heart. Yes, God knows what's in your heart, but your mouth is powerful. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. God has designed us in such a way that what we hear and what we receive is what we think. And he's designed our mouth to be in marriage to our mind. That my mouth will inevitably begin to speak what my mind is full of. And if that be true, and it is, I need to be careful about what I put in my mind. I just can't meditate on anything. I just can't sit around and just scroll everything that TikTok has to offer. I, there are things that TikTok's going to show me I don't need to see. There's stuff that the internet will make available that I don't need to meditate on. One day I'm thinking on it. The next day I'm saying it and the next day I'm doing it. It all begins with what I put in. What goes in is what comes out. If you want God to be glorified in your life, you got to put something that glorifies him in you. Listen, the Tower of Babel exists today. There are still wicked men that are planting visions in the heart of men and women that are outside the will and word of God. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? Come over with me to Philippians. Just turn forward from Ephesians and go with me to Philippians chapter 4. What I put in my life matters. What I meditate on matters. Because what I'm pouring in is what's going to come out. And God has called us to live by faith. To live by faith. And, and Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I'm to live by what God said, live by what his word says, meditating on his word day and night, that I not only be a hearer, but a doer of what he said. His word is what gives me hope. His word is what gives me encouragement. His word is what gives me a vision of my future, not only in this life, but eternally speaking. His word is called to be the foundation and very source of my hope. Hallelujah. And what is hope? Hope is seeing what doesn't exist yet. Hope is looking into your future and seeing what's not there. And we sadly have used that word hope in a derogatory term. When somebody says something positive, we come back in a negative tone saying, well, I hope so. No, you don't understand the power of hope. Hope means you envision it. Hope means you see it without seeing it. Glory to God. The Bible tells me in Romans 8, 24, that if I can see it, I don't need hope. For why would a man 
and hope for what he already sees. There was likely something in your life that you used to hope for, but now that hope is a reality, and you don't have to hope for what you now have. But think about the power of that thing when it was only a hope, when you didn't have it, but you got up early and you stayed up late, when you got in the Word and you got in prayer, as you did the natural, believing God for the super, and people wondered what it was that kept moving you. It was your hope. It was your expectation. It was your vision of a better day, that you wouldn't always live in that upstairs apartment, that you wouldn't always live in that situation. You had hope. You had passion. You had a desire. You had a vision for a better day, and that thing moved you, and it got you through school, and it caused you to get up and work three jobs, and it got you to move on when nobody else was there. Your hope kept you alive. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is needed, and God has called us to live by hope. And what does the Bible say about hope? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, faith is the substance of what I hope for. People that don't have hope don't need faith. If I need faith, it's because I have hope. The enemy can wreck your faith if he ever just gets you to feel hopeless. I want to speak to somebody today that feels like they have no hope. I'm here to tell you that you got hope. You got lungs. You got a mind. You got a mouth. Use it. Dream again. Vision again. Believe again. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think of him. Quit letting social media and news media talk you out of your future and talk you out of your marriage and talk you out of your destiny. Get back into his word. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Look at this in Philippians chapter 4. I want you to see this. If you don't see it, you'll never see it. If you don't see it, you'll never see it. But if you ever see it before you see it, and then you see it after you saw it, when you couldn't see it, can't nobody tell you what you can't do. Can't nobody tell you what your God can't do. I don't know about you, but you got to me too late. I remember seeing it when I couldn't see it, but now I see what I used to couldn't see, and now I see that he's able, that he is Jehovah Jireh, and that whatever I can see, he's able to do in my life. Can somebody holler out Jehovah Jireh? Jehovah Jireh is defined as his provision shall be seen. It was Abraham in Genesis 22 that named a Mount in Moriah Jehovah Jireh because it was on that mount that God provided a lamb that saved his son, one that he had been envisioning for three days. When he was asked about his future, when he told those servants, y'all wait right here. I am the lad go yonder. I am the lad come back. The vision that gave him an answer when his son, who was apparently about to die, looked up at his daddy and said, I see fire and I see wood. Where is a lamb? And Abraham, by hope and by faith and by a vision, looked at his son and said, my son, God will provide. God will provide. I don't have it. I don't see it. But I believe he's able. And when he got to that mountain at the right time, he looked and that ram was caught and it was there. And God told him to sacrifice that lamb. And what did he name that altar? Jehovah Jireh. And what did he say behind it? He said, his provision shall be seen. In other words, if you can see it, you'll see it. Yeah, go on, Clay. Let me catch my breath. <laughs> Tell your neighbor if you can see it. You're going to see it. Now, I know a lot of naysayers. I know there's a lot of naysayers. They say stuff like, well, I can't see it. Don't worry, you won't. 
But what did God tell Habakkuk in that second chapter? He said, at the appointed time, at the appointed time, the vision shall speak and not lie. If it tarries, wait on it. If you can see it, you will see it. Many years ago, I was sitting in my uncle's recliner in my aunt and uncle's living room, and there was a little window on the wall that went above the kitchen sink. And my aunt was in there washing dishes, looking through that window, and I was on the other side in the living room, sitting in the recliner, reading Genesis 12, where God told Abraham he was going to make his name great. And I was meditating on Galatians 3.29. That if I belong to Christ, I'm Abraham's seed. I looked up at that window and I told my Aunt Erlene, I said, one day, word of God will be a household name. And she looked back and she said, yeah. I said, no, I'm serious. I see it. One day, word of God in Shreveport will be a household name. She said, yeah, James. I said, no, 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 Erlene, you ain't hearing me. I, I know it. One day, word of God will be a household name. And when I drive down the street and I see billboards and city buses with <laughs> word and Jesus all over it. I remember when I had to see it, but I couldn't see it. But now I can see it. Now I can see it. Now I can see it. Hey! Not because of who I am. I ain't nobody. I'm Hootie James from Woodlawn High School. I'm nobody. It doesn't matter who you are, where you graduated, or where you came from. If you see it, Take a neighbor. You're going to see it. Man, y'all got me fired up. Y'all got me spitting on my gray Baptist suit. Woo! Man. Watch this in Philippians 4. Problem is we don't see it anymore. Let the devil talk you out of faith. Let the world tell you what you can't do and what you can't be and where you can't go. Developing all these bad visions. Second Corinthians 10, 5 says when you have an imagination, an image in your mind, and it's contrary to the word of God, cast it down. I can't let ungodly images hang around my mind. You might ask, how do you get rid of them? With your mouth. You sit around silent. An enemy can mess with you. You set your mind on his word and speak it, and there ain't nothing he can do. You can't meditate on one thing while confessing another. So here's what I want you to do in your mind. I want you to say this in your mind, not with your mouth. And then when I tell you to say something, you say it. All right? In your mind, I want you to count to 20 by twos. Ready, go. Now say hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What happened to your counting just now? It stopped. Because you can't meditate on one thing while saying another. When the enemy gives you thoughts of death, and discouragement and defeat, deception, division, and darkness. Don't sit around and let him kick your head in. You may not be able to stop the birds from flying around your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. You open up your mouth and you declare that never have the righteous been forsaken or his seed begging bread. Speak the word of God over your life. You so sick, you're about to die in the mind, but with your mouth you say, I will bless the Lord for he forgives gives all iniquity and he heals all disease. Psalm 103 verse number 2. Declare Psalm 91 16 with long life he will show me his salvation. Yeah. 
Line your mouth up with his word. Ah, do you in Philippians 4? May you all find me. Watch this in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are a lie, whatsoever things are dishonest, is that what it says? But that's what our media is filled with. You better pay attention to what your kids are looking at on that phone. Wrong stuff in, wrong stuff out. You better get out of that idea. Oh, it's just something I'm watching. No, no, it's more than what you're watching. You're painting, you're painting an image on your heart. Before you say it don't matter what's in my heart, you better read what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you might say, I've never committed adultery, but I say if you lusted in your heart, yes, you have. You might say, I've never committed murder, but if you have hate in your heart, yes, you have. Jesus was saying, if you don't capture that thing while it's in your heart, it will manifest in your life. God has given us the ability to capture the thing while it's in our mind and get it right there before it manifests. Because if you see it, you're going to see it, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Why are, some of, why, why, why are some of you chasing the little girls around? Because you saw something. Oh, I'm being real now. See, you want to come to church and get coochie, coochie, coo. No, we do no coochie, coochie, coo. That's a problem now. We're trying to preach in such a way everybody just feel warm and fuzzy. No, I want this word to irritate me. I want this word to clean me. I want this word to pull some stuff out of me. The other day, I got a little splinter in my hand. Pulling that little dinky splinter out hurt. Why? Because once something sticks in your flesh, it thinks it belongs. But not everything that's stuck in your flesh need to be there. And sometimes when I get in this word, it's to get that mess out of me. What am I doing with seed? What am I doing with the word? What am I doing with my thoughts? All right, verse 8, Philippians 4. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, what sort of things are of what? Good report. If there be any virtue, which means power. If there be any praise, and that's vocal. Praise is always audible. You can't find praise nowhere in the Bible that was silent. So if anybody says, I'm just praising him in my heart. You are deep. Too deep for truth. You can't praise him in your heart and it not come out of your mouth. Praise is audible. And he's saying here, if there be any praise or if there be anything that's audible that is consumed with who he is and what he has done, then read that last statement. Think on these things, which means what you think on controls your praise. He said, you want praise to come out of your mouth? You got to be thinking on the right stuff. And, but, but, but let's just be real. Now, let's not be deep in church folk. Let's be real people. We are so quick to speak negativity and death and failure and defeat because it's all our media and our world is consumed with. And so we're not offering praise. We find out Johnny got the new job. What do we say? Probably going to lose it like he did his own. <laughs> we find out Johnny done got in a new relationship. Shoot. What's that, his fifth one this year? <laughs> See, we're, just, we're so negative that we don't know how to say anything positive. 
You having a good day? No. What's good about it? See, there's something wrong with your meditation that would have you say that. I ain't trying to pick on nobody. I'm being real. If, if, if praise is going to come out of my mouth, and I'm not just talking about in, a, in an anointed worship service where we're congregated and offering praise with leadership of singers and musicians. I'm talking about how you praise God in line at Walmart. I'm talking about how you praise God stuck in the left lane going down 31, 32 loop and wondering why that person in front of you ain't in the right lane. You ain't saying, well, my steps are ordered, Lord. Thank you for the slow driver in the left lane. Obviously, you're trying to stop me from getting somewhere as quick as I would like to. Thank you, God, that you're saving me from an accident I haven't seen yet. No, we're saying stuff. Get back to the word. If there be any praise, you got to think on the right thing. Tell your neighbor that. If there be any praise, you got to think on the right thing. Your mouth and your mind are married to one another. If you would, come with me to Psalms 130. Now, we'll be done when we get to Psalms 19. And we're at 30, so I don't know how we get back over there, but... I'm just letting you know, hang on. Because 945 service, when we got to Psalm 19, I could have swung over hell on a rotten corn stalk and shot the devil in the eye with a water gun all while singing, victory is mine. It, was, it got intense. So I don't know what's going to happen at 1130. We'll see. But let's go to Psalms 130 first. I think I said 30. Go to 130. And when you get over there, say amen. And look at it in verse 5. Man, you never know what the Lord is going to do. Now I ask forgiveness. Because I had told the guys in the study after 945, I said, yeah, that's probably the one we'll put on YouTube and TV and all that. Because I have to pick a service every, every week. 945 was on fire up in here. And now, after I done got this 1130, I'm thinking, man, we might better put the 1130 one on TV. That might be one of them. Ha, ha! See, don't say you're going to do anything in the next hour. Because you know not what the next hour is going to hold. This is the hour of power. Again, third time today. Watch this in Psalms 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. Read the next statement. And in his word do I hope. Read that part again. And in his word do I hope. So where am I getting my vision? Where am I getting my vision? I'm getting my vision from his word. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, people perish. That means they give up, cave in, and quit. Vision builds discipline. Vision won't let you quit. Vision is a power to keep you steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Notice the psalmist said here, it's his word that gives me hope. It's his word that makes me believe. It's his word that's giving me the vision and the hope for my future. In his word do I hope. We need to have the word of God as the foundation for everything we envision for our life. All right, go with me to Psalm 19. And as you turn there, let me talk to you about Joshua. Ooh, glory to God. So God came to Joshua in chapter 1. I know you're going to Psalm 19. He came to Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 8, and this is what he said. He said, I've given you my word, Joshua. And I want you to meditate on it day and night. And I don't want you confessing it out of your mouth until you have first meditated on it. Don't let it come out of your mouth until it's gotten in your heart. 
Now, why would God tell Joshua, spend time meditating on the word before you say it? Because what we speak, we make public. And what we speak is now open for debate and criticism. And sometimes we say things too, so too soon. We get the right thought, but we say it prematurely and we let folk talk us out of it. So when you say something, you better have what you say or you'll never have what you say. So God told Joshua, before you go to confessing what I say, meditate on what I say and then say it. And then five chapters later, he put it into action. Ooh, glory to God. He says, Joshua, I want you to tell the children of Israel to see, see, S-E-E-C, I want you to see that I have given you Jericho. Now, Jericho was a city that had a border of walls so thick they could race chariots on top of the walls. And it was sealed and shut up. And God said, I have given you Jericho. Go tell the children to see it. See, I have given you Jericho. And so Joshua delivered the word. And he said, we're going to walk around these walls of Jericho six days, and I don't want you to say nothing. Shh. Just see. Just see that I have given you Jericho. And for six days, they walked around those walls, and nobody said nothing. They just see, see, see. See, if you're going to see it, you've got to see it. And they spent time seeing it before they could see it. We walked by faith and not by sight. You see what I'm saying? And on that seventh day, he said, when the priest blows them ram's horns and you hear that sound, I want everybody to say what I said, that I have given you the city. And they proclaimed it and the walls went down flat and they took the city that they had previously only seen by faith. Notice they had to hear the word meditate on the word, see the word, and at the right time, speak the word. Where are we letting the enemy interrupt that process? Watch this in Psalms 19. When you get there, say amen. We'll start in verse 7. I'm almost done. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Converting the soul. What is the soul? It's the mind. It's the will. It's the arena of faith. It's where we fight and lose or win every battle in the mind. When Jesus died on that cross, the place of the cross was called Golgotha. And Golgotha is translated place of the skull because in the mountain hewn out, uh, by nature, it looked like a skull. Jesus died at Golgotha, at the place of the skull. Why? So that I could win inside of mine. Glory to God. The battle we face is in our minds. And so God says here, my word will convert the soul. Let me say it another way. The word of God will change your mind. This word convert in Hebrew is literally translated restore, that he restores my soul. He restores my soul. Say that out loud. He restores my soul. In the 23rd Psalm, David said he restoreth my soul. When David said that, he was saying it from the vantage point of a shepherd, and he understood how sheep would lie down, and because of the disproportion of their body weight, if a sheep ever lie down in a rut, they couldn't get out. They couldn't get out of a rut. They had to be very careful where they lie down. Matter of fact, sheep don't even like lying down because it's very hard for them to get back up again. That's why the Lord has to make us lie down. But what prevents a sheep from lying down? Fear that if they lie down, a predator comes, or friction breaks out in the fold, and they can't get up and flee quick enough. And they have a fear of lying down. So the Lord, in order for me to lie down has to remove my fears but here David said he restores my soul and that's that's declared here that he converts or he restores the soul sometimes our mind gets in a rut and we just can't get out of that rut of fear and 
negativity and brokenness and failure. But the Word of God can bring you out of that rut. The Word of God can change your mind. It doesn't matter what you feel like or what you're going through. Get in His Word. Get in His Word. His Word has the power to change your mind, to change your worldview. Nothing and no one is without hope when you get in the Word of God. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. By what? By the renewing of the mind. People say, well, aren't you worried if you preach certain things in the Bible, it won't offend somebody? I'm not worried about it offending somebody. The word has the power to change the mind. And once my mind is changed, I'm not offended. I need my mind changed. So he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgment of the Lord are true and righteous all together. I'm almost done. He says in verse 11... By the word, the servant is warned. And in keeping the word, there's a great reward. Well, what you say? Now watch verse 14. We could have went from Genesis 11 and just read Psalm 19, verse 14 and went home. Because this verse sums up the whole thing I've been saying for the last 42 minutes and 38 seconds. Watch what he says in verse 14. We're about to close. Read it with me, Shreveport and Bossier. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I don't just need my words right. I need my mind right. And if I can get my mind right, I can get my mouth right. The reason our mouths are messed up is because our mind is messed up. And the reason our mind is messed up is we've been putting in all the wrong information. Oh, it's just music. No, it's words. It's a seed. You can take a grain of wheat and throw it in water and it'll swell up won't become anything. It'll just be swollen. You can take a grain of wheat and throw it in a fire and it'll burn and become nothing. Or you can take that same grain of wheat and put it in dirt and it'll grow a harvest you can eat from. I need the kind of information I can put in my heart. I need the kind of word I can put in my heart. And when it goes in my heart, you can't see it at work. It might as well be in under the dirt. You don't know what's going on. When I was a little boy in our backyard, my daddy had a garden. And he would plant that garden and he'd put a stick at the end of the row. And he would take that bag of seed and he would put that bag of seed over that stick so he would know what was on that row. And as a little boy, I'd be out there all walking around. He'd say, right, son, don't step on my greens. And in my mind, I'm just stepping on dirt. He said, what do you mean stepping on my greens? But he was calling the thing that be not as though it were. Because he knew what he had planted there. He protected what he had planted there. He watered what he, hey, hey, he watered what he had planted. You need to put something in your heart that you will protect. Put something in your heart that you can water. Because you know in not many days that thing will come to harvest in your life. And you will benefit from it. And that is the power of the word of God. You might think I'm crazy. You might wonder what's authoring this praise and what's going on in my life. But you don't see what I got tucked away in my heart. You don't see what I'm working on. I can't sit around somebody using all that language. You messing up my seat. I can't stand around somebody talking about perversion and how many women. You know, I, I got to get away from that. I'm trying to protect. Hey, I'm trying to protect something in my life. Oh, it's just a movie. No, it ain't. It's a vision. One day it's on your screen, the next day it's in your bed. Ain't no coochie coochie coo at Word of God. I'm telling you like it is. Explain that to the children later. 
If you don't want it in your life, don't let it in your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, out of the heart, out of the heart flows the issues of life. If you don't want it in your life, don't let it in your heart. But if you want it in your life, just get it in your heart. You got to be ready to fight, though. You got to be ready to fight. Because Jesus said when they had heard the word, Satan would come immediately. Come on up here, Brother Jefferson. Come on up here, Brother Jefferson. Help me, Brother Jefferson. He said Satan would come immediately. What's Satan trying to do? He's trying to get that word. He's trying to grab that word, brother. You're the devil. He's trying to take that word. I ain't letting you add his word. I ain't letting you add his word. You feel me? Now you try. Get that word in your heart. Get that word. Don't you let it go. Don't you let it go, brother. You live in a fight. You better get, get that word. Don't give it up, man. Love you, brother. Stand to your feet and give him praise. Hey. Glory, 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 glory. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. If there be anything in our heart that you didn't plan, well, let's just meditate on that for a minute. Is there something in your heart? It didn't come from God. It came from a Nimrod. It came from the spirit of rebellion. It came from the spirit of fear. It came from your past. It came from a lie that was told you as a child. That you were going to always be like your uncle. That you'd never get out. That you'd never be nothing. I'm talking to some young ladies right now. You let an oppressive relationship change the way I'm talking to somebody. You let up. You let an oppressive relationship change your view of yourself you let some man tell you that nobody would ever love you and that you weren't worth nothing and now you've taken that into your present and you're viewing yourself and your future through the eyes of an oppressive man who only took from you and stripped you and took you of your dignity and your value. But I say unto you, woman, thou art loose from your infirmity and from that lie that's been spoken over you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You are free. You are a daughter of the Most High God. You have his spirit. You have his heart. You have his love. You are the apple of his eye. And you are not what other men have said about you. Be free today. Be free today. I come against every spirit of Nimrod. I come against every spirit of rebellion in the name of Jesus. I come against every lie that's been planted in the mind of men and women and children of God who have been lied about their purpose and lied about their meaning and lied to about their value. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that heaven is near, that heaven is here. And I thank you that your kingdom has come and that your will is done and that every stronghold is broken in the name of Jesus. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. I plead the blood of Jesus right now over every foul spirit that has planted a lie in the mind of the children of God. And today we will not fall victim and we will not fall prey to the spirit of Nimrod. We will not be used as pawns to build false idols and temples that only bow to the glory of man. But from this day forward, we will live for the glory of our Savior and his, his name is Jesus.
Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your kingdom today and that from this moment forward, we will fill our hearts with your word. We will fill our mouths with your praise. Just say in Jesus' name. Somebody's free today. I just, I just know it. I just know it with everything in me. I just know it with everything in me. Somebody's free today. Young ladies, get off your phone. Quit building your value based on some reel on Instagram. Some video of some loose girl on TikTok. Your value is not found in your appearance. You are virtuous. And any boy that would only chase you for your flesh is not worthy of having you. You are valuable. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are loved by your Father in heaven. Your value is not in a relationship. It's not in followers. Lord Jesus, make us free today. Make us free from all the confusion of Babel, all the confusion of this world, news media and social media and the narratives that have lied to us and filled our hearts with vanity and pride and self-glory. Oh God, make us free today in the name of Jesus that we would not live for the praise of men, but that we would live for the honor of you, oh God, our Father. In Jesus' name. And young men, I say to you, you were made in the image of God. And you are leaders. And you are anointed. And you are a purpose with a name. And even if you've grown your whole life without the influence of a father, say as David did, though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will raise me up. I speak the name of Olive Bait over you in the name of Jesus, that you have a strong father. You have a strong father in heaven, and all things are possible unto him. You've been adopted by the Spirit of God into the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can say, Abba, Father, you have a daddy. You have a daddy. He's God Almighty. He's the creator of heaven and earth, and he is your father. And you were made in his image. You're not a mistake and you're not an accident and your history doesn't define your destiny. Men, if you grew up without a father, I want you to come down to this altar right now. If you grew up without a father, I want you to come to this altar right now. After I sense the Holy Spirit telling me to do this. If you would, I want you to get around that front row and just face me. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to come down there, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something real simple the Holy Spirit just told me to do. I'm going to give you a simple hug. Because I want you to know your Father in heaven loves you, and he embraces you, and he's called you, and he's equipped you. And his word is going to give you the wisdom you need to live a life that will bring him glory. And no matter how short or how long your life is, it's still a vapor. And any curse that came on your family before you is broken through you in Jesus' name. Your children will know a father. Your grandchildren will know a father. Your children's children's children will know a father in the name of Jesus.
Amen, amen. For victory in this house, you guys can return to your seat, your lady. We ought to shout up in here. Pray this prayer with me, Heavenly Father. I'll live bait. Abba Father. I believe you love me. That you have a plan and you have a purpose for my life. Now, according to your word, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I believe you sent your son to die for my sins that I could become your child. And I believe you raised him from the dead that I could have a new life in hope of eternal life. So use this life. I reject every lie. And I will not be led by Nimrod or any other lies in this society. I make a decision to build my hope on the foundation of your word and that your word will manifest in my life. And as it does, I will give you you all the praise and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let heaven hear you shout this morning. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God, church family. With that word, you are dismissed. Love on somebody on the way out. Hope to see you Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. I love you. Have a blessed week.